The scripture that we're reading this morning from uh, John 16, 16 to 24, is at the tail end of the Last Supper, and Jesus is, is talking with his uh, disciples really about the, the next couple of days. This is Thursday night, the following morning he will, he will be uh, arrested and crucified by three o'clock, he will be dead on the cross. And he's saying to them, in a little while you will not see me. And then in a little while you will see me. And so he's talking about his resurrection on Sunday. Of course, it's probably in Jesus' mind that there's, there's um, too much apprehension about what's going on in Jerusalem because there's, the Sanhedrin are now openly um, against him and, and plotting to, to uh, trap him no longer because of any blasphemy. They simply want to find him and arrest him and, and uh, put him into a mock court and have him killed and be done with. But Jesus is talking to his disciples. If, you, if you've been watching at all the series coming out of America called The Chosen, you'll find a very, a very apt portrait of Jesus, especially around this time where you come to realize that Jesus is not just another minister. He's not just another prophet. He's not just another uh, holy person who's uh, exemplifying God to believers around the world. There's, there's an incredible gulf between the meaning that Jesus is acting on, which is rooted in the uncreate Father, God beyond the whole world, the whole of creation, and the meaning that the apostles have in their own hearts and minds and the believers, you know, the followers, who, who are tagging along, and what they have in their mind. And what they have in their mind tends to be um, a purely human elevation of life. That's it. But for Jesus, there's a salvation program going on, and it, it's, it's far, far beyond the average human ideas of spirituality. Uh, today, for example, I've got friends who, who are uh, uh, part of the uh, Tibetan Buddhist movement in the world. I've got friends who have no uh, religious affiliation whatsoever. And for them, life it's, is either a spiritualist uh, in its nature or it's secular in its nature, and they have no idea whatsoever where Jesus was coming from and where Jesus is today in his uh, shepherding of salvation in the heart of a person. Here we are on the night of the Last Supper and he's still holding back from saying, tomorrow morning I'm going to be arrested and killed. But hang on, on Sunday morning I'll be back here and resurrected again. The plain speaking of Jesus is not present in the scripture, and probably for good reason, but if you were following a religious teacher like this, it would be a massive leap to figure out what's going on in his mind. And it shows also that the spirit of God is not yet in them for their understanding of things spiritually. And, and it's, that's the huge point of, of Christianity. You might remember when Paul, St. Paul was doing his ministry, he came to people and he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, we've received the, the, the baptism. And he's saying, well, have you received the laying on of hands for the Holy Spirit? No, we don't even know what that is. And that's the whole point. You're not just joining the club through baptism. You're wanting power from on high. You're wanting the power of God's Holy Spirit, God himself, God as Holy Spirit. You're wanting that to come and animate your life. And when it does, all of a sudden, glory to God, there is this whole spiritual outlook inside of you that never was there before in such a way and never was there that remained. And this is the whole Christian message, that when the Spirit of God overtakes you inside, there's a whole lot of blessing from God and privilege in God, and the doorway to eternal life opens up in a completely different way. 
you'll notice that the eternal life of other religions tends to be either a recycling into this world or none at all. In other words, just sort of vague and, and, and unknown and, and it's just a possibility. But Jesus is saying that I'm doing a work here so that a Holy Spirit will be released into you. In other words, the eternity of God, the infinity of God's possibilities, the power of God over the world will be released into you. And necessarily, it'll change your behavior. It'll change what you think, how you think, uh, what you think about, uh, how you live your life, the meaning that you get for your life, the purpose that you bring into your life. It changes. You're not just religious. You are a person now of the infinite and eternal beauty and love and gorgeousness of God. And that reshapes your life. It's, it's that power of the Holy Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the way that the Holy Spirit magnifies holiness and righteousness and goodness and kindness and mercy and love in you. That's, that's the purpose of Jesus. Well, how do you tell that to a bunch of, you know, 12 fishermen and, and local workers and a fellow who's about to betray you for a few bob because he, he wants out of this whole movement now. How are you going to tell them that that's what's on the cards? You know, that's what's coming. It's very difficult to believe that you're sitting there in, in the Last Supper dinner. It's very difficult to believe that Jesus is saying, I'm going to enable you to become like me. Most of them say, well, you know, you're the Lord. Let us sit at your left and your right hand or let us, let us be servants to you. But there's not the vaguest thought, I want to be like you. I want to have the spirit of God that you've got on, on you. I want to do the works that you do in spirit. I want that. No one has said that. You look through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Who comes up to Jesus and says, oh, I want what you've got? No one. And yet this is what Jesus is bringing. And our glory to God, Jesus is absolutely unknown until Pentecost arises and then all of a sudden his disciples and his believing friends are suddenly filled with the spirit which they recognize is the same spirit of God, the word Jesus Christ. And they, they are transformed. They start doing things in spirit. They're not vaguely interested in religion any longer. They're interested in giving out the love of God and the mercy and compassion and the forgiveness and the power of God, the healing of God. And, and the miracles of God just happen to come along. You know, that just happens to be a byproduct. But the greatest thing is this transformation of soul. Well, here's Jesus. And he's saying, he's saying I'm going to go away and you're going to mourn. You're going to grieve. But then... I'll come back, you'll see me again, and you'll forget about all your grieving, just like a woman who forgets about the pain of, of um, giving birth. The last day or days, and certainly the last hours, are very, very rarely comfortable for a poor mum who's just given birth. But then he says this wonderful thing. He says, very truly I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, Anything, ask and you'll receive, so that your joy may be complete. Imagine this in your, in your own life. Imagine that you're looking after someone and she's dying. Or you're looking after someone and, and they're heartbroken. And you're looking after them, you're with them, you're comforting them, you're... You're not filling them full of words. You're just sitting shiver with them. You know, you're there. You're being with them. And the Holy Spirit rises up inside of you and gives you all the confidence for the resurrected life. Or well, the Holy Spirit rises up in you with a fullness of the certainty of the goodness of life that overcomes the broken heart. You're sitting there with this person and everything inside of you wants with every ounce of your being to pour it out for them. 
to give that to them so that, as Jesus says, your joy may be complete. And so Jesus is in this position of, of knowing when you're a spirit born like this, you're going to want to have um, answers to the challenges of life coming upon you. And those answers will complete your joy, not only having the spirit, but being joyful, being complete in the spirit. It's a whole personal transformation. So you, here you are with your friend and your friend is dying, you know, your, or your client is dying. You're, you're, you're blessing, you're being a blessing to that person. I, I have a friend who was exactly like that. I've known him for years. We were very, very close. And I came down the last weekend when he was going to die and and he wanted he wanted blessing. He wanted me to pray for him. He wanted me to, him, he wanted me to tell him what the father's moves were going to be. And I said to him, "You're going to go to sleep shortly, and you're going to die on on Sunday morning, maybe Monday at the latest." And he was really content with that. And it's an opportunity to pass to him the confidence that he in spirit now has complete joy. And he did. He was so grateful, so thankful. And so when you're with somebody and you're caring for somebody, like somebody with a broken heart, you're, you're, you're helping them through the broken heartedness, for example, or the isolation of, of being estranged in the world because of hurt, because of damage. And the Lord puts a word to you well, they ask a question and the Lord speaks through you as, as the Holy Spirit does. You're looking upon this person and you're wanting them to rise up in the spirit of God, in the power of God, even though they're going to die. But a heartbroken person, you want them to live. You want them to be free, to be shed of that thing that's shackling them. And you speak a word to that person and you want them to get the spirit, but you also want them to be joyful in the spirit. You don't want them to become some sad, ragged ascetic who's hidden away from the world, fearful of contacting anything. You want them to be alive and full and rich in spirit. This is what you want. So this is getting a taste of what Jesus has got going inside of him as he speaks to his apostles. By, by John 16... Judas is already gone, so he's talking to his 11. Maybe John Mark is listening at the door. So this is the glory of God in this morning's Holy Communion. That Jesus is releasing to us what it takes to be like him. And it's a huge leap to be a disciple of Jesus, blessed in the Holy Spirit and doing works of the Holy Spirit and taking on a world uplifting ministry. In his day, his world uplifting ministry was making a portal for people to come into eternal life. And that required association with through the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit through him and to the Father. That's, that was the arrangement. That is the arrangement today. But we don't have to do that. We don't have to create a world uplifting ministry for the salvation of the world. The salvation of the world is already there. And so to take on a world uplifting ministry these days is to do the works of Jesus for the sake of the whole world. And it takes us out of our small ministry into a globally minded care for the whole world. And to that end, you'll find yourself doing a work that no one else is doing. You'll find yourself on the crest of the wave. And God's got a million waves to stand on the crest of. And they're personally designed for you. And your contribution is like becoming a new musician, becoming a new artist, becoming a new dancer, becoming a new expressionist in some way. And your expression lifts up people in the world and, and lets them relate at a global level. 
They, they appreciate humanity's suffering and sin, and they appreciate humanity's victory in the spirit and their joy. And their joy is made complete in Christ. The joy, your joy is never made complete when you can sit in meditation to the, to the exemption of all thought and all interruption. The joy Jesus is talking about is joy that is filled with the angelic host heavens and the supernatural heavens, the, the beyond the grave heavens. When you're filled with that in yourself, there is a supernatural joy of Christ that's yours. And so your ministry reflects that and your ministry pours out of that. In our monastery here, we live according to that. We live as an outpouring, something fresh, an ecumenical way of being fresh monastically to people so that people of all kinds of Christian persuasion can come here and take our Holy Communion, for example. People of all Christian persuasion, all of those in Christ, can, can recognize, oh, this is a new way of doing monastic things. Glory to God, look at that, fantastic. And this is Jesus at work. How is Jesus going to be doing that in your life? How is Jesus going to be influencing you in such a way that you've got divine Holy Spirit power and thought and energy to look upon the whole world as Christ's children and then to be moved by Christ to serve his children in a completely new and unique way. Not just parroting what your elders have gone and done before you, not just turning into some religious mimic, but creatively doing something for God that is absolutely unique because Christ in you is creating it every step of the way. This is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Creativity, individuality, united in Christ and the whole of the heavens. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.